Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to another Tea Time SEO. I hope everyone's got their tea today or coffee or beverage of choice. Ready? <laughs> so today is another international Tea Time SEO. I'm SEO Joe Blogs from Authoritas, dialing in from Barcelona. We also have Carrie dialing in uh, from the Authoritas team and she is from Putney. And we have uh, Barb dialing in from Las Vegas, Charlie from Oxford, and our own uh, CEO, uh, Lawrence, calling in from Twickenham. So we have three great speakers, three experts going to be talking to us about uh, keyword research. There's a lot of insights that they are going to be sharing with us today. So please leave your questions in the chat and we'll be back for Q&A at the end. And I uh, just want to say thank you everyone also for joining us for Tea Time SEO. This is our um, third to last uh, Tea Time of the series for 2020. Uh, we've had a huge number of uh, attendees and uh, over actually nearly 70 different Tea Time sessions and over 120 unique speakers. So thank you all for taking back part. And I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, the speakers now who will give a brief intro before we delve into those insights. So over to you, Charlie. Hi there. Uh, I'm Charlie. Uh, I, I'm an SEO and content strategy consultant. I'm uh, an independent one, having worked uh, for agencies in-house over the course of the last 12 years or so. Um, and yeah, I'm pretty excited to be talking about keyword research today, one of my favorite topics. Hi, I'm Barb, and I am a SEO consultant with Compass Digital Strategies. Also, my favorite subject, keyword research, because it's kind of at the core of SEO. I've been in digital marketing for a lot of years. Um, I focus in um, the strategy, the content marketing, and local search, and I do like to run marathons for fun. So. Thanks, Barb. Hi, everyone. Lawrence O'Toole, the CEO, founder of Authoritas. I like to watch marathons for fun. And um, as you can see, I'm a cake eater, not a cake baker, according to Joe. Um, I got into SEO back in, I don't know, uh, before the year 2000, so a long time ago. So I'm normally the person with the greyest hair on the uh, on the live stream. And um, I also uh, love talking about uh, content strategy and how keyword research plays into it, and particularly into implementation, how you can practically do things at scale. So thank you all to our speakers and to our audience, um, those that are uh, watching us live. We're going to pass over now to uh, Charlie, who will share his insights all about keyword research. Awesome. Uh, I say hi, everyone, and thank you very much for that intro, Joe. Uh, keyword research is definitely one of my favorite parts of SEO. Not always the doing of it. It can take a long time and so on, and you know, hard work is hard work. But what you can get out of it, the strategy, as Lawrence pointed out, you can learn and so on, fantastic. It's one of the most powerful market research tools I think we have available to us in any discipline. So today I want to share some quick real quick, I've only got five minutes, tips on how to make the most of your time uh, that you spend on keyword research. Uh, the idea I want to get, you know, to take away from this, if possible, is that you want to categorize your keywords. Run your process through a number of steps that helps you make sure the keyword ideas you get out are something that you can deliver on, where you can fulfill what the search is trying to achieve. When you can marry that up, that's when good things happen with your content. Now, the first step is knowing what you're going to be doing this research for, because what the aim is very much, you know, sort of has a big bearing on uh, the kind of what you're going to do. Uh, and then tips I'm going to want to share quickly on are on how to expand your horizons to find more ideas. I know Barb's going to talk about about uh, some great stuff on doing this using key, uh, sorry, content gaps, which is one of the best ways of doing it. And this is where you know to find more ideas and what the audience wants to know. Grouping your keywords into topics so you can find the common themes and mapping intent so you know what the right kind of content is that's going to rank, so you know what to build. Okay, so uh, let's kick the thing off then by expanding our keyword horizons. So my first tip is going to build on what's working already by using Search Console data. Uh, there's a huge amount of information in here. If your site has any kind of history um, and you've written articles in the past, you've got or you've got lots of commercial pages, whatever it is, there's going to be loads and loads of queries in Search Console 
that where you've got um that you can use and build upon to do new ideas or expand your current content it's a real treasure trove of keywords in here that i think people sometimes forget about because they just rush to finding new things in keyword research tools so go to the performance report start looking for keywords where you're seen as relevant but you maybe aren't addressing directly and then start working out do i expand the page to address this do i do something new and so on Again, as always with good research, find the common themes that you can build some good stuff around. Of course, you can use a Search Console API as well. We'll be talking about APIs here on T-Time Messio next week, but the Search Console API you can use to find more ideas. Um, you can use an add-on for the Google Sheets, like I think it's called Search Analytics for Sheets, or if nothing else, just build a little table in, uh, in sorry, Data Studio so you can start querying your pages, see all the keywords they appeared for, and start finding those bits where you can start getting new stuff out. Okay, so the second tip is around building on questions, not topics. There's small demand for many questions, but often lots of questions with the same intent, which added together equals a lot of demand. What I love about using questions is that it makes you build a page around, and if you're sorry, if you build a page around them, it forces you to actually answer the question rather than just writing about the keyword, which if you're not Wikipedia or a dictionary website, isn't the aim of your content. You don't want to write about this, you want to write what the user wants to get out of when they type that keyword in. And questions is a great way of doing that. Of course, you can also use questions as you know, subheadings throughout your article or your post, or even for your e-commerce page and you know, for your product page and so on. Loads of great stuff with questions. Uh, to get ideas, you can use keyword tools. On the, uh, here, I've got um, Systrix up on screen, uh, which is cool. Uh, and on this next slide, thank you, Jay. Um, you can also scrape that people also ask uh, questions directly just to get lots of starter ideas. This is a tool called Also Asked. It's free. Go in, use it, put your C term in, pulls out this lovely visual, which helps get buy-in from people higher up the chain sometimes when you can make things visual. Nice little way of starting to build more keyword ideas. Um, there's also... Loads of free keyword tools that use this kind of stuff. Um, uh, here you've got an example from keywordtool.io. Don't just use questions like who, what, when, why, how. Things like best, you know, comparisons and so on. Another way of finding kind of question style topics to build your content around. And finally, on expansion, uh, most time as SEOs, we're not the experts on the business itself. So make sure you speak to those who are the experts. I have a little set of questions I have whenever I start a new project where I ask the experts the kind of questions I can learn from them on common queries, pain points, barriers to purchase, and so on. Your secret weapon for this is on the next slide, and that is to actually sit down with them, buy them a coffee or a beer when you're allowed to, of course, because of the lovely state of the world. But when vaccines happen, sit down with people. It's a great way to get real answers out. And you're going to get better information than just by sending an email or something like that. Speak to the experts, whether you're in-house or agency side. Okay, next up, my fourth tip is around grouping those keywords you found into topics to help build better content experiences. Find all the angles. We're looking to find those keywords with the same intent. We just build one page to target all of those. And where there's not just one page we can build, but a whole range of articles in a topic we can build. It used to be called like the hub and spoke model very often in SEO. Many days, uh, thanks to HubSpot and the article I've got on screen here, you can see it's often referred to as content hubs. The idea is we build these hubs of information. There was a great article about this last month by uh, Samuel Schmidt, which I've referenced on the next slide. I strongly recommend you check that out. It's an example of how we used uh, topic clusters to build uh, just huge amounts of traffic by doing the research and then the different topics all around this one keyword. So Google thinks you're not just an expert on one keyword, but on a whole series, so you must be an expert on the topic as a whole. It's about building that sort of authority in that topic. Finally, uh, what you want to do, of course, with this is SEO tools can help you out with these finding these topics. Here's Ahrefs uh, using the parent topic uh, kind of mechanism they have where they put a bunch of keywords under a parent topic because, you know, if you rank for that keyword, you tend to rank for the other ones as well. It's an idea of building a topic out. So do that when you do your keyword research. Last but not least, uh, mapping things out by intent. Intent's become a really big thing that people have talked about in the last couple of years, but I still don't see people using it enough. Um, I, we wanna know what the intent of the search is, or at least what Google thinks the intent of that search is. So we know what kind of content we have to build to satisfy that search. Back in 2007, Rand Fishkin, knowing these four kind of query, uh, sorry, search intents, navigational, informational, commercial investigation, and transactional. There's been lots of work about expanding this. There's, a, uh, there's an article on the screen here about on content harmony, uh, where um, Kane Jameson expanded on this idea of like about nine different intents or something like that. But the idea is to build out. And I think um, 
Uh, the cool thing is, as on the next slide, I have some tools will give you uh, this this intent. This is Systrix. They use the kind of intents that are listed in the Google Search Evaluator guidelines as a way of breaking it down. And this is based on SERP features. If you have a map pack, there's probably some uh, sort of you know visit in person intent. If there's shopping ads, um, then or product ads, then there's likely to be some commercial intent and so on. I don't really mind what you do, how you work it out, what tool you use, but know the intent of your keyword before you start producing content or even think about targeting it. Because if you don't, how do you know whether you're actually in a position to address that intent or not and actually start ranking? Um, I guess the, you've got an example here of the SERPs. If you look at the SERPs for keyword research tools, there's actually some mixed intent here. There's some articles, there's some tools directly. Can you produce the right kind of page that's going to rank this keyword? If nothing else, do you know if it's informational or if it's commercial? If you do that, you can break things down. And the last slide I have kind of shows if you group things by topic and you group things by intent, you can do clever stuff. So this is just a small snippet of the massive keyword research spreadsheets I end up producing as everyone does these days. But I can group all my keywords by the topic and then I can then sort of see how much the search volume there is by topic, so you know whether we're worth investing in or not. But also, we can also tell from that how many of those searches are commercial searches and how many are informational. So we can weigh up the type of content and whether it's worth investing in producing that kind of content or not. Okay. Let me remember to unmute myself this time. Thanks for that, Charlie. That was um, that was really good. I have a lot of notes now, so I probably have some follow up questions. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna talk about keyword mapping and what to do with those keywords once you find all of them. It's the process of taking each of your keywords and putting them to each of the pages of your website so you know how to optimize for those pages. There's many tools, there's many methodologies, there's no right or wrong way. The point is trying to reach your goal and what you're trying to accomplish with your website. And not every page has to have a keyword. So for example, a lot of the times you're going to probably not map out the contact page because if you're going to optimize it for or optimize for anything, you actually don't want that page to come up in search results necessarily. So if they land there for some for some query, let's say they're looking for, um, you know, I don't even know, baby diapers, something I'll never buy. <laughs> if they're looking for baby diapers and it comes across the content or the contact page, that's really not enough information. So you don't want them to land on a page that doesn't give them what they're looking for. So there's some pages you'll want to de-index or no index. Um, okay, next slide, please. This is um, an example of how to find content gaps. So basically looking for, um, one way is like your competitors. If you're looking to see how they're getting their traffic and you want to find ways that maybe you're missing out on it, this is one way to do it. A lot of the tools have some sort of um, form of this, either keyword gap, content gap, that kind of thing. And what you do is you put in your competitor URLs, you put in your URL, and then it spits out a bunch of keywords that are um, that traffic is going to those competitor sites that you're not getting. You can also, a lot of them also say, well, you can do like the top two or where all of them have traffic and you don't, or maybe just one of them has traffic and you don't. So that's a good way to find new keywords. Another example is, um, I got this one from Steve Toth of seonotebook.com. If you haven't um, heard of that, it's a really good um, resource for SEO. If you go into Google and type site colon and then a competitor name, or even maybe somebody in another industry that you're looking to see how they're doing their content and how often you can type in their, their um, on there, it says the domain and then before colon and then the date and then after colon and then the date. And you can see a list of everything that Google indexed. And if it has a date, I think that's typically like, um, like blog posts and things like that. I don't think regular pages have the dates as much, but you get a sense of everything that they published in that date, either um, like how often um, you can see some of the sort of the sameness of it or some of the commonalities. And if you use SEO minion Chrome extension, you can extract that into an Excel sheet so that you can do some more research on it if you want and then do like filters and all that kind of stuff. Look for some commonalities. All right, next slide, please. So here's a, a brief example of a keyword URL map. There are, of course, a ton of them out there in terms of how granular they get. Um, the base one that I use a lot of the time on the left-hand side, you'll see just has a list of all of your URL pages 
and then it gives a page type and then there's a keyword that you want to um, rank for. And then what it does is it pulls from that left hand screen to from the right hand screen. It's another sheet in the same workbook. And that has a list of all the keywords, all the keyword difficulties and all the search volume. So when I plug in a keyword into the, the worksheet on the left, it auto populates from the sheet on the right. So I don't have to keep going back and forth on and see what kind of numbers I have for each keyword. The one on the right, that is from all the research and all the keywords that you found using Charlie's tips and Lawrence's tips and all of that stuff. You plug that all in and you usually get this from a keyword tool. Um, keyword difficulty does um, differ from tool to tool based off the, their methodology, but essentially it tells you how hard it may be to rank for that keyword. And then it gives you the search volume that's happening usually globally. Now, when I use it over on the left hand side, then the one on the right hand side turns green because usually you're going to end up with like thousands of keywords. So you want to see which one easily that you've used or that you're looking at to use. So that is, um, that is the keyword mapping. Oh, and then the other thing that I sometimes do um, with the keyword map is um, I start putting in call to action. So you should have a call to action for every um, page. So I'll put in there another column that says, oh, it's going to a form or it's going to another page with more information or that type of thing. Um, and yep, yeah. and then you just start plugging away one by one, matching them up. If there is something that you're already doing, like um, Charlie mentioned with Google Search Console, you can pull that all in here and see what the keywords are first, see if it matches. If you don't like it, go find a new keyword. Um, this is the part that's also time consuming because you're actually looking and thinking about that search intent and thinking, oh, do I want to rank for that one? Is it too hard to rank for? And that kind of thing. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I think you guys have covered all my slides now. So, um, but uh, I'll, um, I'll try and summarize really uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, for me, keyword research, you know, it's something we've, I've been doing 20 years and it's the, it's the easiest part of the SEO process. Uh, but it's also, you know, the easiest part to get wrong. You know, you make, you make a lot of decisions based on the research you do. So if you get it wrong at your peril, uh, for me, it's the foundations. It's like building a house. You know, this is the foundations of your SEO strategy and really getting the metrics, organizing, and drawing the insights and setting your strategies, putting your walls and your roof on your house. So um, without with wobbly foundations, everything is going to fall apart around your ears. So for me, there's sort of four areas that I look at is, I look at it as a start of a process. You need to pick a keyword research tool. I think there's three types, manual, what I call pretend automated tools and the fully automated solutions. Um, you then need to harvest the keyword data. So keyword metrics, user intent, consumer questions, the cert features, the stuff that Charlie and Barb have talked about. But I think for me and the stuff I'll sort of concentrate more on is how you then orchestrate that data. How do you take all that data and use it in a way that gives you insights at scale that then you can implement and set an SEO strategy and implement quickly uh, across your site. So, um, so let's skip through, I'll skip through one and two quite quickly and we'll get into three and four. So we'll go to the next slide. So manual research tools, look, we all know you can manually, just go back one side, you can manually research tools. There's a gazillion browser plugins. There's lots of keyword research tools. Obviously Authoritas have one, but you know, use your favorite keyword research tool and what will it do for you? It's going to produce lists for you. And you can put in your domain, your page, your competitors' pages, and you can do it all manually if you want. If you like a spreadsheet of millions of keywords, probably like the three of us do, that's fine. But if you don't and you want you want something a bit more automated and get some draw some insights out for you, then you really want to use something that's a little bit more sophisticated, perhaps, than some of the um, just just the plugins that give you lists. So if you look at the what I call semi-automated tools, um, really a lot of SEO platforms like us will have tools that do content gap analysis for you. So they'll allow you to put in your domain or find your competitors. It will find um, content gaps, the keywords they're ranking for that you're not ranking for and try and distill some of that down to for you. So you've kind of got a list still, but, you know, perhaps a better refined list with some keyword opportunities. But at the end of the day, you still got to do a lot of work, as as as, as Bob said. You know, you've got to uh, find keywords that do don't match your pages, keywords that do or don't match the user intent of your pages. Which keywords and which pages to prioritize? Which topics and themes should you go after? Um, we have a tool which um, probably not a lot, a huge number of people will know about. And it's designed for very big sites, and it does this at scale. So it does 
the harvesting of keyword data from your top 100 competitors. And it does, if you like, like 10,000 Venn diagrams. It compares you to everybody and then everybody else to everybody else. It clusters all those keywords by topic and then maps those to your pages. So you can understand straight away which topics and themes have the greatest potential. Uh, you can recommend the best pages for you to optimize and effectively suggest new pages to create. And it will do that at scale. And we just, just out of interest, not a small plug for us since we, we, we uh, we're on, we now can do this in 26 countries. So if you just move on to the next couple of slides, you'll see that we can do this in you know, Swedish. We can do this in, um, uh, there's lots of Swedish keywords there. We can do it in uh, Spanish. We can do it in Italian. And the idea here is that it gives you a prioritization matrix of topics that you can go after based on what's the best potential traffic for you and how strong you are against the competition. So that's what I call a fully automated solution. But at the end of the day, you've still got to implement it. So whether you get data you know, from your, pro, your Chrome plugin, your favorite SEO tool, us or anybody else, at the end of the day, you'll end up with, with lists of spreadsheets or lists of, lists of uh, Google Sheets full of data with keywords, search volumes, search features, intent, competitor data. If you just move on. Um, and obviously, you can go out and get lots and lots of questions that relate to those keywords. And obviously, that's something we do with our Frequently Asked Question Explorer. I think for me, if you can just move to the next slide, please. Um, what's interesting is then automating the user intent. So we have our own SERPs API model, and we analyze the SERP features and over 40 SERP features for Google and then build that into a SERP model so that you get a spread of user intent across navigational information, commercial research, and transactional, an indication of whether there's local intent for keyword, and also what the overall dominant intent is. And as you can see from the keywords on the screen, some are obviously informational, but some are, are you know, they're not, it's not always black and white, it's not binary. Sometimes they have a mix of research and transactional with a hint of navigational, but it's a good way of you mapping those, those uh, different types of keywords, clustering them together and matching them to your site. And that's really what I want to talk about now is once you've got all this data, what do you do with it to try and draw insights? So for me, one of the key things you can do is find questions that are central to your theme by mapping keywords and search volumes uh, to the questions that come up. So for every keyword, obviously Google shows people also ask results these days, um, shows related searches. Um, but if you just focus on the questions that come up on, on um, related searches, you can actually map your terms and the questions together. So imagine a keyword like, um, I don't know, uh, you want to rank for keyword ranking API, which we do. There'll be lots of related questions that come up in the SERPs for keywords related to Google SERPs API, Google Keyword Ranking API, Keyword API, et cetera. And you can capture those questions and then link the two together. So you link head terms with the questions that come up in People Also Ask, and you can put them into a graph. And um, so if you just go back one, what that allows you to do is very simple. There's a great tool here, which is it's not one of ours. It's called uh, Graph Commons. And it allows you just to create two Google Sheets. And you have a set of nodes in your graph and a set of edges that link the nodes. The nodes are keywords and questions. And all you're doing is saying, these questions come up for this, these keywords. These questions come up for these keywords. And then it will cluster them. And you can see here, it's automatically clustered sort of our keyword research topic into lots and lots of different related topics around keyword tools, competitive keyword research tools, long tail keyword tools, et cetera. And on the right hand side, you can see questions. And if you just go to the next slide, what it allows you to do is, is the pink one there is, is a list of questions. It's actually too small that I can't read it myself here. But um, it will, um, what it will do is, is um, relate your blue head terms to the questions. So you can see the questions that are most central to your theme. And if you just move to the next slide, in this example, what it's telling me is I've looked at all my keywords in a topic and I've found lots and lots of questions that consumers are asking, but I'm actually saying which ones are absolutely central to that graph. And here you can see that it's actually listed those out for you. And you can say in this topic, what is a good keyword? What's an example of a keyword? How much does SEO cost, keyword research services, SEO keyword research tools? Those are the questions that are most central to the topic. So I really uh, encourage you to check out that tool. It's, it's quite good fun playing around with it. Um, there's an alternative, which is the, one, the slide I've included here, which is called Kumu.io. Uh, they are both free and it, they both work from just importing data from Google Sheets as really easy templates to follow. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, of course, 
it all comes down to setting SEO strategy. For me, what that looks like is do things at scale, analyze your whole industry, analyze a bit like um, Bob gave the example of that tool where you were looking at which keywords your page was ranking and also looking at other keywords you're competing with and which keywords they're ranking for. But rather than run it manually, do it at scale, automate it across all your pages on your website, and then look at the ones which have the highest potential for growth and where you're relatively strong against your link metrics against your competitors. This way you can then look at, if you look at the, that matrix, the top right-hand side, sorry, go back one. If you can look at the matrix, what you've actually got is uh, a matrix of high potential and high relative strength. So low to high, low to high. So top right is where you're relatively strong and you've got great potential. So those are the topics and the pages where you've got, you know, you should focus first. The ones at the top left, which aren't too many on that slide, are where there's great potential, but you're a bit weaker. So it's more like authority building. The ones to the bottom right are you've got high relative strength, but low potential, the kind of maintenance. And if it's bottom left, bottom left, low, low, don't bother. You'll never get there. So that's a way you can automate your content strategy. And you can produce that kind of matrix manually as long you know, using the tools that, um, that uh, we've already outlined between us so far. Um, if you go to the next slide, another way of looking at tools and some things that we've done with clients before um, is actually just look at, okay, so you've taken all that research, but can you produce some sort of editorial guide to help uh, customers uh, understand, help editors, help your SEO teams understand what kind of content they should be producing? And here's a good example. This is more, um, I, think it was, uh, I think it was to do with Pram and babyware. Um, so you can look at the modifier types for the keywords. So colors, superlatives, comparatives, um, singulars, um, descriptors, so cheap, safe, size, et cetera. You can look at the different types of keyword modifiers and then look at the smell of the SERP. What does Google want? What does the SERP smell like for that set of phrases? And you can see then the predominant dominant uh, or predominant successful content types. So for example, for superlatives, top, best, cool, good, it will come as no surprise that buyer's guides and articles, so you know, editorial reviews with lots of content snippets and images, they rank and perform really, really well. But if you're doing secondhand cars, used pre-owned cars, then e-commerce category pages, Gumtree, the listing sites, auto trader, et cetera, predominate. And this just helps you produce a template, if you like, for thinking about then how you roll out your content strategy. And if you go to the last slide, the last point, and really, uh, last two things uh, I want to mention is, this is an automotive example. You can also map all of this to your buyer journey and actually think about different stages of your buyer journey. Uh, it's probably quite small and quite hard to see, but you might think for buying a car through orientation, selection, financing, trade, and ownership. Those are the different stages of your buyer journey. And different stages, you've got different head terms, different uh, consumers' questions that are central to those themes. The SERP landscape, the pages that are dominating the SERPs are different. They are, they are editorial articles flowing through to listing sites and you have different competitors. And that's another way of then segmenting and thinking about your strategy. Uh, the last couple of slides, um, when it comes to actually doing it, of course, implementing your SEO strategy, you've mapped everything to the page. Um, Google's already warned us. I mean, this is a classic example. You see lots and lots of um, content on e-commerce category pages, for example, but ultimately you've got to implement the content, um, add schema markup, um, obviously people will stuff a lot of content into e-commerce category pages, but you've got to be careful that you don't alter the intent or the signals that, that page is about because you can see that if you add too much and it looks too much like an article, then you may not rank where you want to rank for the kind of phrases that have got the intent that you like. The other thing you could do in this area is, of course, add consumers questions that answer specific product related or brand related questions, which would be much more useful if you're looking at car seats in that example to answer lots of questions. And there are loads about Braco car seats, um, you know, different brands, Recaro car seats, et cetera, et cetera. And the last thing, and this is our favorite, is a case study with the Price Minister a long time ago, um, where if you do everything at scale, uh, you can f literally analyze millions and millions of keywords, find the best opportunities, find them in new content clusters where you're not ranking, match those back to your product catalog and create SEO-friendly landing pages at scale. And it is a great way for big sites to automate some elements of SEO strategy. So that's it, really. Um, I hope that just about covers everything. I'm probably overrun as usual. Yeah, well, thank you very much, everyone. Loads of great tips, sir. Um, we just got a couple of questions that we have time to answer, so I'll pass over to Kerry. 
Great, thank you. Um, so I'll jump right, right in. Um, our first question is for Charlie. How many questions should a page answer? For example, should I dedicate a pa one page per question or should an FAQ page work with a selection of questions grouped together? That's a good question. I think the answer, without doing the classic SEO, it depends, is uh, what, what the type of questions you're dealing with. So if you're talking about common questions around your business or common questions around your product or service, then an FAQ page, grouping them together makes sense because they're probably going to be quite short answers and things like that. If you're dealing with like a more complicated user manual, about stuff then actually you know like how do i achieve this with your product and there's probably quite a lot of content and that's going to be a common question that you know warrants its own page if you're doing it in a kind of classic keyword research i'm looking to write a bunch of blog articles and things like that or creating a topic cluster then it might well be that you want to group them you know sort of in one way by having a top level guide that mentions all the questions, answers them simply, but then links through to the page that has a more full answer. Another good example, of course, is what Lawrence just talked about there. If you've got common questions around a specific product, you know, you're an e-commerce site and you're reselling something else. Um, I did this when I was working for a retailer that sold electronic goods like phones and tablets and laptops and things like that. Well, there are often common questions around those specific products. Those go in the product page because that's where they're going to be most useful. They're going to be good for SEO, but they're also going to be good for um, conversion and all that kind of good stuff as well. So it's about the level of question and about the demand for it. And of course, you can always cheat. If you do a search for that specific question, what's Google showing? Is it showing a bunch of really massive articles and pulling out part of it? Or is it showing very specific questions? Don't try and find against the tide. Obviously, Google talked about the new passage-based index or passage-based ranking. We call it passage indexing. It's ranking. Passage-based ranking, as in we're going to be able to pull stuff out of articles more deeply to kind of go with this whole idea of people ask, ask questions and so on. If today's update that came out an hour ago is potentially around that, as lots of people will now be hypothesizing, then it kind of makes sense that if you've got like this kind of um, these deeper sort of sub questions around a bigger overall question, then put them all together. But where a question warrants its own space to breathe and be really focused and you want to need to do the on page optimization, that's when it warrants its own page. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. I'll just, add, um, I'll just add to that. Just um, if you use the like the clustering tools that I just mentioned, um, like uh, Graph Commons or Kumu, you can um, you can see directly across across a, a, an enormous range of keywords the questions that are central to different topics and subtopics, and that will help give you an indication um, of um, which ones merit you know, their own page, because maybe they have big search volume and they link they link a couple of topics, but they're not really close to one specific topic. And sometimes you'll see multiple questions that are densely in the middle of a topic. And it's, um, you know, if you want to improve your relevance, then um, it'd be good to write to answer those questions on the same page. Great. Thank you, guys. That's really useful. Um, and I have a question for Bart. How long should you spend doing keyword mapping, do you think, would you say? Uh, how long should you spend it? Yes. As long as it takes. <laughs> it depends on, uh, yeah, it depends. So if you have a few pages on your website, it'd probably take you only a couple hours. If you have a bunch of pages, it could take you a few days. Um, I've heard of people spending almost a month, like it could take forever. So depending on how, how many pages you have, but it takes as long as it takes. So um, sometimes you might even go back and you'll be to the end and then you'll be like, ah, crap, I picked the wrong one. So you have to go back and do it again a little bit. So just yeah, to no add to that very quickly, <laughs> one of the tips I was thinking of doing for this before I realized I'd already had way too much was that um, don't always try and take on uh, doing keyword research for an entire site in one go, especially if you're covering many different subjects. It then becomes so difficult and so time consuming that you start doing less a good job as you go on through. If you can focus on either a topic or a section of your site or an individual article and then have a process that's really robust for that, you're going to do much better work doing that, focusing on that, and then getting it in place. The other thing as well is if you do this massive list, and I've got, I've got 102,000 keywords I've mapped out for our website. Great. How the hell are you going to start implementing that? Whereas if you've got one small bit, it's actually much more practical. If you follow like, Bob's recommendations and do this properly, you're then going to have a really robust plan of how to put those mappings and those keywords in place. If you try and do it for everything, it just becomes overwhelming. So, yeah, I, 
I, I definitely think don't bite off more than you can chew. Um, but yeah, de I, I agree 100% with Bob. It takes as long as it takes. Great, thank you. Um, and we have one final question. Um, Lawrence, how do you do um, keyword clustering manually? Uh, well, I would say don't, uh, obviously, I'd say just automate it. Um, but I mean, even our, our product is designed for big sites, you know, they're ones that are ranking for, I don't know, a couple of thousand keywords already, because weight of numbers, um, you know, if you're ranking for a couple of thousand keywords, you find your top 100 competitors, you will probably end up with 10, 20,000, 100,000 keywords. And then clustering algorithms, community detection algorithms work really well. You can really start to see how Google's organized a, a little niche here where Google's ranking these top sites and you can start to see dominant authorities in different clusters. I think on a smaller scale, it's, it's much harder and, and, and you will have to, um, to do it manually. Well, you can obviously do it manually yourself, um, but there are tools to help. Um, there are tools, the ones I mentioned would be quite useful, I'm sure. Um, so things like Graph Commons or Kumu.io or any online graphing software is a good way of doing it. There are also other clustering tools like Carrot um, and some open source tools that you could use. So um, there's plenty out there, um, but um, I try and avoid, um, I'm one for automation and doing things at scale. So I, I try not to do anything manually if I could. Great, thank you. Um, well, that's all the questions we have time for today. So I'll pass it over to Joe. Thank you guys for your tips and questions and answers. Yeah, thank you all for giving up your time and sharing that with us today. Um, and Barb, I know you had some a course that you're working on, so um, feel free to drop it in the chat, the private chat, and put it in the um, main chat as well. And also we can tag you on Twitter afterwards uh, okay. about, your, um, about your course. And I also wanted to say that um, we're back here uh, next week, um, but we'd like to hear from you. Uh, we're looking to have a couple more speakers join us to talk about APIs. So if you have been using APIs, whether you just started, um, whether you actually, what you found useful, um, different reports that you can pull or, or use, um, then we would love to hear from you uh, because we'd like to have three speakers join the Tea Time SEO stage as we had today with Lawrence Charlie and Bob. So please um, get in touch with us and we would love to see you on stage next Thursday. So thank you once again to our speakers, uh, Barb, Charlie and Lawrence uh, for another international uh, Tea Time SEO dialing in from uh, Las Vegas, Barcelona, Putney, Twickers and Oxford. So hope to hear from you soon about coming on stage with us next week. And if you've enjoyed the video, click a nice little like button um, down below and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm just going to share the, the keyword research course from Barb and you can contact Barb and find out more information about this research course from Barb. I'm just writing and sharing that now. Thank you. Good stuff. Go and check out the course everyone. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Thank you Joe. Thank you.